Hi, Paul Beckwith uh, back again. So in the last video, I ended up talking about the 100 meridional and how it's shifting in North America. So I'm going to continue on about some other ways that we're redrawing the map on uh, climate change. Want just to emphasize, um, this, is, uh, this has very, very severe consequences and implications. Climate change is a global emergency, okay? It's a true emergency. Forget about walls and things. So, um, anyway, let me uh, get out of here. Okay, so we'll go back to redrawing the map. So I showed how the the hundred meridian is shifting. Now another big factor is that Tornado Alley has shifted five hundred miles east in the last thirty years. So the darker purple or blue are more tornadoes, fewer are the lighter shades. So you can see how this, the centroid of most of the tornadoes were in this region before, and the whole center has now shifted over. Most of them are here, much further to the east, 500 miles to the east. So Wizard of Oz, when if the remake of Wizard of Oz, it, instead of having Kansas um, being smack dab in the middle of Tornado Alley, Okay, South Dakota to Texas, things have changed. So now tornadoes are much more likely to hit homes 500 miles to the east in southern states like Tennessee and Alabama. Okay, so tornado activity was looked at going back to the 50s when modern tornado records began. Compared the first 30 years of records with the next 30. This is showing the shifts clear shift as to where the tornadoes are hitting the hardest, both in terms of the total number of tornadoes and the number of tornado days. Okay, Oklahoma, area in Oklahoma was king with a total of 477 tornadoes in the first half of the study period from 1954 to 83, those 30 years. That area's tornado count decreased dramatically, down 45% in the second half of the study period, 84 to 2013. And an area in northern Alabama bumped up 48% to 477. You know, coincidentally, this exact same number of tornadoes, right? But they're happening 500 miles to the east. The number of days in Tennessee when there were violent tornadoes doubled from 14 to 28 days. So it's a new heart of tornado activity. So why did this shift happen? They don't know exactly. Um, they say part of it is maybe how tornadoes are reported, right? But mostly it's the changes in temperature, the changes in the dry line, the change in where the moisture, where the warm, wet, buoyant air is coming in from the Gulf of Mexico, the changes in the wind shear to start triggering off tornadoes. <clears throat> you need a high cape. Um, which is a high um, convective available potential energy, C-A-P-E, CAPE. Um, I think that's the, what the acronym stands for. So you need high CAPE, but then you also need a trigger for the tornadoes. So you need the wind shear. So those conditions have moved to the east. Okay, another way in which we're redrawing the map is the plant hardiness zones are moving north in the U.S. at 13 miles per decade. Okay, so... These are the zones. You have zones of hardiness. Mostly they're defined by the temperature, the lowest temperature that occurs in the winter because plants have to survive the worst, that extreme, and then they're okay for the rest of the year. So these are the zone, hardiness zones, zone 2 to 11 here. And what you can sh see is the border lines are shifting. Okay? The hardiness zones are moving north. Okay? The temperatures are less cold so the plants could survive further north. So if you're in a particular zone, you, that you used to be in this particular zone, now you can survive your plant, you can survive much further north. Okay, so the zones have shifted northward. Okay, um, you're wondering where zone one is. We don't see zone one in the US, but we do have it. It's it, in the Alaska and Siberia is zone one. Okay, uh, zone five is the Corn Belt in the U.S. and so on. So this is hugely important for, for crops. Okay, hardiness maps are published around the world. 
but it was first the idea was first developed in the U.S. U.S. Department of Agriculture first published it in 1960. Okay, each zone marks out a 10 degree Fahrenheit band, minus 60 to minus 50 in zone one, 60 to 70 degrees in zone 13. It alternates by, you know, each zone is 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 10 degrees, so minus 60 to 50 would be. Um, zone one minus 50 to minus 40 zone two you know and so on those are the coldest temperatures reached in the winter okay um so the map was last updated in 2012 half the country was upgraded to half a zone warmer than it had been in 1990 all the lines shifted to the north okay so um and so they project what's going to happen in future scenarios, and we're getting this climate velocity, if you like, of 13.3 miles per decade. Okay, that's with present trends. Of course, we lose sea ice, jet streams completely changed, and all of this stuff is off the table. Okay, um, you know, and it talks about how, you know, suitable growing ranges for different fruits and things. You know, some fruits do better, some worse, but overall, in the longer term, it, it doesn't look good. Most things are going to do much worse okay let's move up to canada now the permafrost line has moved 80 miles to the north in 50 years in parts of canada so here's where we are today this is a permafrost now permafrost is defined as frozen ground okay it's ground it's ground that is below zero degrees celsius for at least two years in a row okay so it doesn't go above zero in the summer that's how you define the permafrost you know it may contain frozen frozen water or ice it may not it's frozen ground okay and what you can see is you can see that um, the permafrost the, the areas of ground that was frozen used to extend much further south and now they're they're further north as much as 80 miles north and that's happened over a half century in parts of Canada Okay, we know about Arctic amplification. Temperatures in northern regions are rising at about twice, it says, the global average. That's actually more like three to five times, depends on the latitude, but you see often twice quoted. You, you, often you now see it, that number as being three times, but you know it's really three to five. Um, if you look at it, depends on where you, how far north you are. Okay, so as the line delineating an average temperature of zero degrees Celsius moves north, so too does the permafrost line. They track together. Um, it's not well documented. It's underground, out of sight of satellites. Arctic is only sparsely covered with weather stations. There aren't a lot of measurements that, that far north. But one study found that the permafrost around James Bay had retreated 80 miles north over 50 years. So you do boreholes, you drill down, you put thermometers in, you measure the temperature. 20 meters down, the temperature of the ground is increasing as high as one to two degrees Celsius per decade. This is huge. I mean, the, the, the heat capacity of the ground is much, much higher than that of the air. So this is enormous. So if you go down 20 meters into the permafrost, the temperature is increasing one to two degrees Celsius per decade. Of course, you don't see a lot of physical changes in the in the material until you cross zero degrees celsius and then you get thawing of whatever ice is there and then you get slumping and you get um, the temperatures above zero you get organic the organic material in the permafrost starts to be, break down by bacterial decomposition and if it's in the ground there's an absence of oxygen so it produces methane whereas if there if it's near the surface and there's oxygen available then it produces uh, CO2. Okay, so there's been a lot of stuff on permafrost, a lot of stuff on methane. One study predicts that by 2100, the area but covered by permafrost might shrink from 4 million square miles to less than 0.4 million. So down a factor of 10. Okay, going from you know this down 4 to 0.4. Most of Alaska, southern tip of Greenland, permafrost free. Huge effects, okay? Now, we all have to eat, so let's look at the wheat belt. So here's Australia. 1990, the wheat belt, 2015. Look at the frightening changes here. Okay, Australia is losing its ability to produce wheat. 
The wheat belt's being pushed forward up to 160 miles per decade. It's going to be pushed right off Australia. Australia is mostly known for its deserts, coastal beaches, and people living all around the edges. But it, it is one of the planet's largest wheat exporters. Canada's, Canada, Russia, and the U.S. are higher than is Australia. But as the arable land at the southern edge is shrinking, being pushed off the continent, the potential for growing wheat is declining. So, so this is this is a huge areas that disappear from this map are those where the output dropped 50% or more. So yields are just plummeting for wheat in southern Australia. You know, eventually they won't be able to export any wheat. Eventually they won't be able to produce it, and they'll have to be importing wheat. Okay, any given patch of land has a theoretical potential for the amount of wheat it can support given the soil, the climate, which is temperature and rainfall, and other factors. Reduction in rainfall and warmer temperatures has reduced the theoretical potential of southern Australia by 27% since 1990. Okay, so they've gone from harvesting 38% of the theoretical maximum um, to 55 percent okay so they're actually getting they're actually pulling more out per per hectare but there's the the theoretical maximum is is plummeting okay so eventually farmers can only reach about 80 percent of the maximum potential once they hit that limit then you you have to give up basically okay um so now that's in australia now north america the arable land Wheat, the wheat belt is going to higher and higher latitudes. It's okay within limits, okay? Scientists project it could go from about 55 degrees north to as much as 65 degrees north, growing wheat. But the soils are crucial, right? The, the so, you have to have decent soils. Eventually, you're pushed up into areas where the soils are so bad, right? They, there hasn't been enough vegetation, you know, cycling growing, dying, growing, dying, nutrients, overturning the site, soil, creating good soils. The soils are super thin as you go further north and they're not able to, to withstand the, um, to, to grow stuff. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, everything is changing, redrawing the map. Okay. Now this is the lake study. Okay. So, so basically what it's showing is it's showing the, uh, the gray areas Okay, lakes that reliably freeze every winter will be above the areas. The lakes that are no longer freeze every winter are the orange or brown color. And what you can see is you can see with surface warming of these amounts, the lakes that don't freeze uh, annually every winter are getting fewer and fewer and fewer. So climate change could leave thousands of lakes ice free. Okay, so I'll, ta I'll, I'll talk about the study. Basically, 1.4 million lakes in the Northern Hemisphere. Thousands of these used to freeze reliably every winter. Some of them now see years without ice at all. You know, most of them would go to an intermittent ice where part of the lake freezes and part doesn't. An extensive loss of lake ice will occur within the next generation. Okay, this is, uh, th this is significant because if the lakes don't freeze, there's going to be more evaporation. The warmer surface water increases the risk of toxic algal blooms, decreases the oxygen levels. There's not this overturning, you know, of the lake. When the temperature gets to, so the, the two numbers that are critical are zero degrees Celsius, which is where the fresh water freezes, and <clears throat> four degrees Celsius, because when, that's the maximum density of fresh water. So when the temperature of the lake drops to four degrees, that's the maximum density of the water. So that water that's cooled by the air at the surface at four degrees will sink to the bottom. Eventually the whole lake, if it's not too deep, will become four degrees Celsius. Then the water at the top will, will cool down to less than four and it's, it's not as heavy as the four degrees Celsius. So it'll cool and cool and cool to zero and freeze at the surface. Now that sinking water that's at four degrees Celsius in the maximum density is carrying lots of oxygen. So that oxygen is carried right down to the bottom of the lake. Okay, so when you don't have this overturning process, you don't get the oxygen going down to the bottom of the lake and it changes the entire ecosystem of, of the uh, planet. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the actual scientific paper in more detail 
but I'll have to continue in another video. So thanks.